Hey, my name is George Lever, and today I'm going to take you through some of the presets I have made for my Control Hub expansion pack and show you how I'd use them in a mix. So this song is by a band called Pride Lands. The song is called Lake of Twisted Limbs. So what I did when the pack was finished is I decided to take a song that I had already mixed and it's already released and the guys in Pride Lands were very kind enough to let me use their song. And I think it's a really good, um, I don't know, it's a really good song to use because it's got Kind of a bit of everything that I'm known for. It's got really cool drums, it's got some great vocals in there, and there's quite a lot of post production. And uh, there's, you know, guitars, bass, etc., etc. So we are going to take a look at what I did. So I'm, for now, I'm just going to mute all the vocals and I'm going to mute the post production and we're just going to focus on the band section. So if I bring up the drums and I just solo those for this moment in time. So this is where we got to with drums. Okay, so what we're running at the moment is we've got a kick sample that's going off. It's being uh, set off by Trigger. And then that's running into the Sleepy Kick preset. And it's also going off into a parallel bus, uh, which is drum saturation. I'll walk you through that in a little bit. But without the plugin, I, th I just thought some of these tonal changes were really, really neat. So this is one preset that's straight up, loaded it up, didn't really think too much about it, and it just kind of just brings the whole kick in together and does its job. And that was just something that was really impressive with Control Hub. This was a very complex signal chain, maybe four, five, six different plugins, lots of little like tweaks going on, and it just kind of grabbed everything that was happening and going, all right, here it is. This is this is the sound that you had. And, and it's, it's really close. Um, I've got kick click here. I think this is just the top end of the real kick drum being filtered down and compressed. Not an overly attractive sound, but the reason why I've done this is because I wanted to re, um, revoice the kick sample that I had. So you can hear that when it goes out, it kind of becomes a bit more like rock-like, and when it comes back in, it's more like metal. So that's happening, but I'm using the limiter over here in Control Hub in order to really pin that top end. So it means I can make it really bright, filter it out, get rid of all the low end that I don't need in that sound. I picked a different sample. It's called Kick Knock V2. I think it'll just be called Kick Knock in the final thing, though which is just a lot of different um, stages of EQ. So it was two digital EQs, but then this um, tube EQ involved as well. So the whole idea there is to just kind of saturate the whole signal, get it really uniform, decide the top end that I want, limit it into place, and then just blend to taste. Again, really quick thought process happening here. The snare, for those of you that might know my work, I normally run a sample alongside in order to boost what's already happening in the snare signal. So we've got the microphone signals, snare top, snare bottom. They're being gated by using a multiband uh, technique, but no hard gating going on. And then we've got a sample that's resting over the top of it. So at the moment with everything in place, it sounds like this. So that's the sample, and then with the snare, the live mics underneath. Like really explosive, and without the sample. 
nothing wrong with that signal at all. It's got, it was recorded really, really well by a guy called Declan White um, because all the guys live over in Australia. So I had to have someone help me out with that. So thank you, Declan. That signal is being crammed into the preset called snare fatso comp. So that's taking my fatso, my outboard, and shoving it into one preset. We've got some EQ going on before all the color and compression, and we've got some happening after. So the majority of the shaping is happening before the color and compression in order to get that distortion and compressor to move differently. And then afterwards, we've just got a top end lift. So I'm gonna turn this off and on so that you can hear what's happening within that preset, like how much of an exaggerated effect that's having. That's quite a lot that's going on here. So what's happening in the signal, not just al alongside the fatso is, we got this preset and then I started tweaking because the fatso in, in real life is a little, it's very fat sounding, it's a little sluggish. So I've cheated, but it means that it kind of makes the fatso more applicable for this process. I sped it up, changed the tone, changed the uh, distortion a little to make it just really over the top. And as you can see over here, I brought then have brought the mix down to 25% because if, if it was at 100%, it's just going to push that bleed that's in the live mic way too much. It'd probably be all right with samples. You could probably leave it at 100%. But when we're managing bleed with live mics, can't really get away with that. I'll show you what I mean. Off. Just gets a bit over the top when it goes beyond that halfway mark. So that's what I was looking for. And the whole point is just to try and get these signals, at least within the kick and the snare, as sort of sharp and as forward facing as possible without um, becoming overbearing or pokey. It's a fine, it's a fine balance. With toms, honestly, I've run the same tom uh, bus signal chain for ages. So this was really easy to grab. All the rack toms, floor toms and stuff are being gated using a plugin called Sonox Drum Gate, something like that. It's really cool. Otherwise, again, we'd be dealing with more bleed. But then this uh, preset called Tom's Thick, honestly, um, since we made these presets, I've done three or four records where I've just used this. I've gotten rid of the, the old signal chain and it's, it's just done its job. This is one of the ones that that I'm really happy that I don't have to like load up loads and loads of plugins anymore just just to refine it's just in one spot. And I'll show you what that sounds like uh, for the floor tom in this section. So again. It's this sort of process of pulling everything into shape, getting it pinned, holding it in place, kind of getting some more energy out of it and trying to get um, just some more life out of what's going on. And we get to cymbals, which is just, just overheads for now. I muted the other mics. I guess I felt like I didn't need them. And I believe I did a mix of a preset here as well. I did. So I've included a couple of cymbal presets which are designed for fixing microphone signals that recorded poorly. The reason for this is that when you get great overhead signals, they're actually the easiest thing in the world to mix. You just leave them as they are, filter out some of the gunk in the low end, and then just call it a day. I don't know if you really need a preset from me to do that because it's, it's just going to waste space. So what I also get, however, and have to contend with is recorded signals that have just not been dealt with very well. They're in a small box room, or it's being recorded by someone that doesn't know what they're doing, or they place it the microphone in the wrong place, or they pick the poor symbols, whatever. In this case, it wasn't a fault of the recording engineer. In this case, it was just that the bright uh, the symbols were really, really bright. So all I wanted to do in this instance was just take off the extreme edge and just level it in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring the mix all the way down to zero, and I'm going to bring it up to the point that I had it at to show you what how I used it.
So obviously I can push it past that point, but those changes will become exaggerated beyond the point that's useful. So too much, it does focus the symbols really like just on that one symbol that's playing, but it's not connected to the rest of the kit. So that's why it's mixed back down. Uh, we've got a limiter in place as well because I'm trying to bring down that snare peak because I just want to only hear cymbals in that microphone. And that was that. I wish I, there was more explaining to do, but I was just, I was flying through this. Room was cool though, because I've gotten to do something that I've wanted to do for a really, really long time. So this preset is based off my um, 1176, which is a rebuild of a Rev A. I only have one but because this plugin allows me to have two of something, I now effectively have a stereo 1176 Rev A, which doesn't exist in real life, which now means I get to use it for drum rooms. Really, really cool. Really, really awesome. That's super focused, symbols are not harsh, but without it, I don't particularly want to listen to that for too long, so back it goes. So everything again is getting focused down away from the nasties back into the uh, just the voice of where the drum kit is. And in the latest update of um, Control Hub, we have this feature that allows us to not just see where the bands of the different EQs are, but we can also use the headphone button here per band to isolate and solo what we're pulling through. So that's what I used in order to allow me to pinpoint where the cymbal noise was before the distortion and the compressor and then use the distortion to fill the gaps that I'd just made by making that huge cut. And that allowed me to just fine tune everything because otherwise I was doing stuff with too, too many broad strokes and I wasn't finding the pocket that I wanted. But that's been a really useful addition along with the mix knob. Being able to solo a band is really cool. So all of those signals, I've also got a snare room signal but like it's just a sample going into, I think it's Again, the 1176, because I want it to match the room signal. Off. On. Super spanky, really aggressive. What you want. So all of that is feeding the drum bus, which we have here. And this is mimicking one of my presets from uh, a plugin called Slate VMR which just has a distressor in it uh, and an API EQ. But I've ported that over to here. I'm going to show you what happens to the whole drum kit when I turn that off and on, because that's quite a big key component of my drum sound. Off. On. Like it's just, it's night and day. It's really cool. I didn't even have to use the mix. No, it's a hundred percent. It's cool. And in this we've got, I think we've got three different versions. Yeah. Four, five, six different versions of that whole chain in order to go from anything that would be more rock to the signal chain without the EQ, signal chain with EQ or a different EQ. I've given as, as much as I can in order to provide variation as to what's happening. And then I'm, as a result of uh, STL Control Hub, I made a new parallel preset. So this didn't exist in my normal workflow. This was just as a result of me playing with the plugin. So this is really important because I would not have come to this end result without Control Hub having existed. So the purpose of this saturation bus is to, again, just send the signals that are being fed to it down the middle of the stereo image and just really uh, excite all that harmonic content. So what we've got feeding this, I believe, is a kick and a snare. Is that it? Yeah. So I'm going to show you what that sounds like here. Really aggressive. So the whole point is just getting that distortion. And let me show you that in context with the drum image because that's when it becomes a little alarming. Like it sounds cool without it, but it sounds really aggressive and you hear more of the snare wires come through. 
I don't know. I was just I was into it. So I've saved that. That's a preset in there in the pack now called Drum Para Saturation. Don't forget to play around with the limiter in order to get the snare to really push through without it breaking that that final peak that you want in terms of volume. So if we come down and take a look at where I was at with bass. So what I'm using Control Hub here to do is to control the DI before it hits the amp sim. So I'm going to turn off the amp sim for a moment so that I can show you what I mean. So we have the DI here and just solo it. Controlled, sounds like a DI. Turn it off. You can just hear the plectrum bouncing off a string. It's not really got an attitude to it. It's not really doing a thing. But with it on, I mean, you could probably roll with that if you wanted to in something that wasn't metal. But I used that to feed an amp and come up with a super gunky, aggressive thing so that it would sit alongside the drums. The whole point of that is normally when I'm tracking, I'm using my 1176 in such a way so that it's just going to pin that bass in place. And if there's any errors, I'm going to hear it. When I don't have it, it can become a bit wishy-washy. So I'm really happy about how the guitar stuff came out. So the band wanted a particularly like on the edge of fuzz sound. Let me show you what happens when I bring the mix down. So there's some volume change happening here because of the uh, because of the distortion that's happening, but I hope it's really apparent that the fizz kind of just gets nullified and everything gets just shored up and becomes really saturated. It's called juice, right? It's supposed to be really just like umptuous and connecting to the rest of the band. So when we hear all of those signals together, like it all starts connecting. So all of those signals are then fed into what's called a band only bus. And sat on that is my copy of a 33609. And again, I, all these sort of incremental stages of transformer color and saturation really start building a very like thick, honest, genuine musical picture of what the song could sound like. So being able to bring these things into the box has been really useful. I'm gonna show you this again on and off, just so that you kind of like get the idea of what's going through my mind when I'm doing this. And that's just, that's, that's just one piece of outboard that's in my rack that I just send everything through uh, when I'm mixing. And the reason, and you, you can hear it, it's just, it's not really apparent that it's compressing, but it is. It's not really apparent that it's saturating, but it is. And it's, you get that tone curve that happens as a result of using transformers. And this one has six, I think. So it's three pairs, three, not two, three pairs of transformers in the box. And just doing that varnish over and over and over again is uh, at least to me what sounds and feels like music or at least how I remember music sounding when I was a kid. Did I do anything on that? I did do stuff on the guitar lead. Okay, let's have a look because I've forgotten some of this stuff. Okay, so I've just filtered it out and compressed it. Yeah. Again, it's the fatso sound. So this one is uh, one of the individual captures. So not only did I capture things that were being used in a mix, but then I also sent signals through my outboard individually so that if you wanted to make your own presets, you could. So you could have the tone of that unit, but then shape it to your own taste if you felt like, oh, I kind of wish I had a bit more flexibility than what I've got in George's pack. You've got it there. You can, you can go and make whatever the hell you want. So all I've done in this, again, I've used that Fatso Transformer color. I've shaped it up, I've sat it in place, and then I've left it. I've not had to think about it anymore. And so everything's sat together and it's all happy. So since and post-production are a larger side of my workflow and are 
becoming part of the thing that I'm known for with the bands that I work with as well. This song doesn't have too many tracks. This is pretty manageable on a one-to-one -one basis, but I wanted to show what would happen if, I don't think I put any plugins on this. I put it on one. Okay, I'll have to have a look. Two, that's the drum loop. Three, four, fine. Well, I'm gonna show you what I'm doing from a top-down level. So top-down means what I'm doing at a bus first level before then I go and investigate what's happening on a track-by-track -track basis. And what was really interesting was for me was to learn how much change was being uh, encouraged by the signal chains that I put together for post-production. And some people can, well, I've had people talk to me on Instagram saying that they find some of it a bit confusing, a bit complex. So hopefully this can go some way to explaining. So I'm gonna again show you on and off and the change is pretty drastic with this one. So it goes from being fluffy and dark to controlled, uh, brighter, more aggressive, more forward. And this signal chain, I don't know how many plugins it is in the box. I think it, it can be quite a lot sometimes because there's going to be instances of certain specific frequencies being controlled based upon what key the song is in, along with different saturation curves and different EQ curves. And what I've done here is I've provided five versions of this signal chain so that if one doesn't work for the song that you're working on, you can flick to the next, dial it in using mix, make an adjustment on the color panel, and hopefully it should give you some way of retaining control over something that could be quite chaotic if there's quite, quite a lot of tracks. And I did notice whilst we were pouring through this that I had done individual instances of STL. Okay, cool. So here, this is a really good example, I have taken a capture of some AMS Neve 1073 preamps that I had. I don't have them anymore, and that's the whole point. I don't need to have them because it's here. And I've amped it up, I've overdriven them excessively in order to accentuate what's happening for these bell signals. Bell signals? Bell sounds. I've also added a delay. Yeah, and without. Really spiky, really percussive, really intrusive. I don't need that. Back to kind of tapey, cool, fun. Yeah, I'm about it. Everything sounds better with distortion. Drum loop, where did we get to on this? I, I've got a feeling this is gonna be the fat so. No, 11.76, I am wrong. Yeah, it was just a bit peaky, needed a bit of controlling. Didn't need obliterating, just needed some bit of TLC. So I'm about that, that's cool. So also in the pack are, like I was saying, individual runs of some of the outboard that I've got. And I also did them not only in single states, but I also did it at different um, temperatures. So how hot the signal was hitting the unit, the, uh, the preamp, the outboard, uh, to get different versions of saturation. So in this instance, I've selected the 33609 and the hotter version to get more saturation out of it, and then started playing with the EQ. I've also added reverb, that sounds good. Yeah, without it sounds like it sounds like a compressed pop piano, but this isn't a pop song, so it doesn't need to be in that world. I was thinking more like Linkin Park. Yeah, and there's a second one beneath it. Let's have a look. Is it the same thing? No.
Oh, okay. I just start, I guess because there's nothing loaded, I guess I just started using Control Hub as is and started playing around with what it sounds like without anything loaded in order to make this. I quite like that. Cool. So even without something loaded, it can be a useful tool. So this is the uh, preamps again, but instead of it being like a plus five, it's a plus 14. So uh, this would be just before clipping. Uh, and we've got, again, we've got two stages of clipped preamp sounds in case you want them. And then we've just turned on the compressor, kind of just giving it some TLC, getting everything to hold in place in a really like juicy way. I'm going to keep saying that today, I think, juicy. But it's true, that's what these pieces of outboard are designed to do. Yeah, that should be really complex to mix, really. But with a bit of levels and that one preset, it's all done. I don't know. I, I, I think that's pretty cool. Let's have a look at the singing because the singing was a little tricky. In this song, it goes from like a distorted intro through to like clean bolstered singing there out. Um, so I had to remember how I did it in the record in the first place. There was also multiple reverb sends, which, which I've had to recreate using the Control Hub plugin. And those are in the pack as well. So those are mimicking uh, reverbs that are just multiple different brand names, multiple different values, but they're all in one place rather than just, you know, all over the shop on the internet. But the thing that I found really tricky with this vocal, and guys, if you watch this, I'm really, really sorry, is that some of the source signals were not great for the vocals. The performances were great, but the microphone sounded a bit weak. So, yeah. <laughs> I I, uh, I built quite an aggressive um, preset in order to tackle this because this isn't going to be the only time in existence that this happens. So I thought it might be quite a nice Swiss Army knife tool to be able to have is something that um, bolsters vocals. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to turn off all the reverbs and I'm just going to flick through what happens in that section if I turn off all the STL control hubs in one go. So I reach out for you in the dark Trying to echo locate the beating of the heart So without the plugins being in there, it's like it's fine it's just a bit, it just sounds like raw vocals. But when everything's in, it just really comes together. To echo, the of the Again. I was just really, I don't know, I didn't, I didn't want it like, to replace everything, but it has. And so what happens normally in my um, singing uh, chains, it's either going to be like an extreme level of compression or multiple different compressors, one after the other, dealing with certain stages of compression. So rather than it being like one lump sum, it's just incremental. And this really caught it so well. So I turn off the delay and just show you what's happening. The dark trying to echo love. It gets really like ah. like really like Kermit the Frog at one point when that's not in place. Trying to, trying to echo love. But by putting it back in and just having that stacked compression and distortion in the way. And this 
took me, I mean, minutes to put together once I found out of all of these, which one I wanted to start at. So we've got the same stacked EQ and compression curve, but then we've also got two EQs baked in with two of them. And then I've done the same preset without any EQ for the instance where the compression is correct, but the tone isn't. And then what else did I do? Right. And those go into a singing bus and they're being controlled by the Fatso transformers. So again, it's that sound again of just running something through a transformer in order to get some sort of velvety like distortion quality going on. Do you see the like the theme that's happening here? And then we've got some screams. And this was cool because I used to use quite a large signal chain for screams. Um, and now I don't need to if I don't want to. The light ever fighting as it was. And without the light ever fighting as it was. God told me it's so afraid no one could bear the judge. So this one's tough, or I thought it was going to be tough, because it's again, it's not just stacked compression; it's stacked saturation. And I thought if there was anything that was kind of going to trip the plugin up trick the process of building these uh, presets up. It was going to be throwing multiple different things at it and then going, go on then, figure it out. And, and then I get sent this and it's like, oh, okay, I don't. Okay, well, it's done now, isn't it? And um, this was really useful because it happened at a point in time where I shifted from uh, Intel to M1 and some of the plugins that I was using to build that chain didn't work on M1. But this did, and it sounded the same. So it saved my <laughs> saved my life uh, on quite a few occasions in that interim. And it, I I feel like I'm saying the same thing, but it really did bring quite uh, a lot of uh, freedom back. It's like it's so cool. I'll show you in the mix as well because I think I've not shown you these isolated yet. I, th I just find it really cool. I didn't show you the filtered intro on the singing though, getting distracted by showing all the other different presets. This is fun though. So this is the same signal, I believe, as like the same preset as the chorus, but there is a feeling. Yeah, I've over exaggerated the distortion and the compression and then changed the filtering at the top. So in the master EQ in order to imitate like what tape or a radio might feel like. There is a feeling I'm unfamiliar with You say it's like you're sleeping in a lack of twist Really cool, just useful to be able to just go copy, change, done, don't have to think about it. One plug in, Bosch. Master chain. Okay, so I'm not a mastering engineer, but I do run things on my uh, on my master bus in order to get a sense of togetherness before it goes out, like in this instance, to someone like Jens. Uh, in this case, I've chosen to use the Fatso and bus compression preset in combination with a preset called Master Finishing Touches. So I guess that would make sense. So what I'll do is I will turn these off and then I'll introduce them one at a time. And I turn on this one here, which is the Fatso, and then the other one, which is the Finishing Touches preset. So 
So what happened with those presets is it's not, I'm, my aim is not to try and change the voice of the song overly. The whole point is to just keep overemphasizing what's already there and just bring it forwards. So these aren't huge tonal shifts for the top, uh, top level of your mix or even on your master. They are there just to provide something that is maybe a bit hidden, maybe a bit subdued and bring it up to the front. And that is how I used STL Control Hub with my expansion pack to mimic a mix that took me days to finish. And I got this done in maybe an hour or two. I don't really know what more there is to say apart from, I, I think it's pretty cool. I think it's, it's doing a thing, right? And it does it really well.